You're listening to the St. John's Diamond Creek Podcast. This episode presented by Associate Minister Joel Snipson. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong, that is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you done something completely outside your comfort zone? A work or study presentation in front of a crowd, maybe risking changing your career later in life or going part-time to spend more time with the kids, asking someone on a date or trying for a family or sharing your faith with that friend. See, in all the ways we've stepped outside of our comfort zone, I bet it wasn't from you waking up one day thinking, I want to feel really uncomfortable today. I just need a bit more stretching in my life. No. Sometimes there's external expectations from a teacher or a boss obligating you to do hard things to fulfill a role or unit requirement. Often we step outside our comfort zone because of a deeper motivation within, like really believing in something that we risk short-term discomfort if we're convicted that something is worthwhile. And if we step outside our comfort zone, what's common is the social implications, right? Sometimes risking shame or embarrassment. What if the business idea, new career path, new relationship or faith conversation doesn't work out? How will this failure affect my reputation? Will I feel embarrassed if people can see that my efforts or more importantly, who I am isn't enough. As weakness is exposed, we need the power of external expectations or deep conviction within to overcome risks and doubts and step out of our comfort zone. Well, today we continue in our series in Romans 1 to 4 called The Power of the Gospel. And last week we heard that this gospel is good news, not about a what, but a who. It's all about Jesus. And today in verses 8 to 16, we continue to think about this gospel as Paul writes to this church in Rome. In verses 14 to 16, Paul has three I am sayings about preaching this gospel. I am obligated, I am so eager, and I am not ashamed of the gospel showing something of why Paul is willing to step outside of his comfort zone and share the good news of Jesus to Rome. Well, let's consider the last one first, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For the language buffs, you'll notice that I am not ashamed is a double negative. Paul could have said, I'm really proud of the gospel. But Paul frames the gospel with, I am not ashamed speaking to something about Rome and the gospel message itself. 
See, the city of Rome represented honor and strength and success. Rome is where trends were set. It was the place to be. And whatever your thing was, there was an idol for it. And all with the vast wealth and the grandest of architecture, everyone wanted to visit Rome at least once to experience all the wonder. Well, back to us. Um, as a parent, I've discovered now that there's a lot of parents out there making content on social media about parenting. And while they portray being authentic and relatable in the chaos of family life with small children, it's always filmed in a perfectly curated kitchen and they're making cereal from scratch and their skin is always perfect. Meanwhile, I'm struggling to get my kids to eat store-bought cereal and I've missed the shower. So we know we're not meant to compare ourselves, but it's easy to be influenced by our world's constant messaging of success and sometimes feeling inferior as a parent or in some other ways. Well, it's a p from the position of weakness, inferiority and insignificance amongst the success of Rome that Paul preaches Jesus and not ashamed of this gospel. According to tradition, Paul was ugly and short and bald and had bad eyesight and was not a good public speaker. I may tick a couple of these boxes, not a word. <laughs> but he's not exactly the powerful alpha leader according to Roman standards. And the word ashamed also translates as offended. The gospel about Jesus is an offensive message. See, our culture says that, sure, I sometimes do wrong, but overall, I'm a good person. I should be celebrated and proud of my achievements and to never stop living according to my authentic truth. Yet in Romans, we will see that our gospel says that we're so flawed, un incapable, unrighteous in ourselves that God had to send his son Jesus to die to deal with how we have completely missed the mark. See, just like in Rome, the gospel is utterly offensive in our culture that values self-sufficiency and independence and success. Paul's gospel came through the weakness of the cross, foolishness to those who reject Jesus. And given our message is offensive, as we're out there in the community, there will be temptations to be ashamed and embarrassed of our gospel about Jesus. Jesus even warns his disciples of this temptation to be ashamed of him in Mark 8. So in what environment are you respected, successful, self-reliant, or maybe just fun-loving and not too intense? Whether this is around colleagues or other students at the footy club, where are you most socially tempted to be ashamed of Jesus in your place of success and self-reliance? See, Paul can only step out of his comfort zone, not ashamed with the gospel, how? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation. The gospel is about God's power. See, the gospel is a message, but it's also God's power. So it's more significant than just another philosophy or set of ideas to believe. See, Paul doesn't say that the gospel brings the power. He says it is the power. I worked in the airlines and I was really shocked by how many people had a fear of flying, like literal panic attacks, cold sweats, running off the plane, completely out of their comfort zone. But logically, we only risk sitting in an aluminium tube at 40,000 feet in all sorts of weather, where the only thing between us and certain death is trust in the flight crew. And the power of the turbine engines sustaining flights. Likewise, I would love to go on a cruise ship one day, but I would only be confident to book on my small kids on the cruise because the ship's engines. All that power propelling the huge vessel through the biggest of swells and storms. Otherwise, you're stuck on a floating hotel tossed about in the ocean going nowhere. This gospel coming in worldly weakness is in Jesus is God's power to save. 
We need to wait until chapter three to see how we receive gospel's power for salvation. Yet as we come to Jesus powerless and weak, unrighteous in ourselves, but Jesus taking our place and doing what we could never do, Jesus gives us undeserving people his righteousness. And we'll come back to this idea of righteousness in a sec. Jesus rising again and giving you life means there's no uncertainty. This gospel is powerful to save. Paul's only indebted, eager, not ashamed with his gospel because he had personally experienced this power of salvation in his life, encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. See, on this very day, Paul's comfort zone was using his position as a Jewish leader to persecute Jesus' disciples and destroy the church. This guy oversaw the brutal execution of Stephen, Jesus' disciples. But now, through the power of this gospel, he instantly goes from persecuting the church to preaching the gospel to them, motivated by deep love. See, most of this passage shows the power of Paul's radical transformation. In verses 8 to 13, Paul goes on and on about his deep love and concern for this church in Rome, people he's never met. But yet because this powerful gospel changed him, instead of persecuting and destroying them, he thanks God for them. He constantly remembers them. He prays for them. He desperately longs to see them and tries to see them multiple times. Paul's new love for this church was more than fuzzy feelings, but an inward drive to share the gospel to them. And this had huge ramifications for individual lives, but also their community together. This gospel powerfully united two separate groups in the Roman church, the Jews and the Gentiles. They were divided and in conflict. And it was all made worse when the emperor kicked the Jews out of Rome in the year 49. The Jews would never associate with, eat with, be in business with the pagan Greeks, who were now the majority in the Roman church. But the power of the gospel breaks down all religious, social, ethnic divides, creating one new Jesus community to live in Jesus' unity and peace, sharing his justice and love. See, this idea of unity was completely unthinkable and only possible because of the power of God that brings salvation. The gospel, God's power, transforming lives and entire communities May this be our story. If you don't identify as a Christian but feel broken and lost and like spiritually you're on a plane at 40,000 feet with no engines or out to sea with no power, we believe that God can powerfully save you in Jesus. For everyone else, do we actually believe that God could save your unbelieving son, daughter, family member or friend? That the gospel is powerful to soften the hardest of hearts in your school or workplace or street with unbelief all around us. See, like Paul, let's pray and share trusting that Jesus is powerful to save. Come with me to verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So the gospel is about God's power and righteousness. What the righteousness of God revealed means is actually much debated. Some say it's about who God is. Others say it's about what God does. Or is it about what God gives us in the gospel? I think it's all three, but let me explain. God's righteousness revealed is about God's character. In Romans, Paul, like a lawyer, defends God's righteous character, particularly shown in Jesus' work on the cross. Next week, Paul rigorously defends God's righteous judgment. Later, we'll see God's righteous offer of salvation. God always acts righteously, consistently with his righteous and just character. 
the righteousness of God revealed is also about what God does. And we heard this last week from Tim that in the gospel, God has been faithful to his promises, particularly with God's people from the start all the way back in Genesis. This powerful gospel continues the story of God's salvation first for the Jews, yet also doing something new in welcoming the Gentiles into the Roman church. And the righteousness of God revealed is about Jesus' righteousness given to us. Some translate verse 17 as righteousness from God instead of righteousness of God. It's a righteousness revealed to us, Paul says. If we think about righteousness, it's a word about our position, right? Who we are in relation to others. Are we a righteous customer with our phone company? Does our record show we've paid the bill? Or as a driver, right, with Vic Rhodes, are we righteous with a perfect record or do we have demerit points? See, righteousness is like having the correct boarding pass to board the plane or ship. You know, the crew check the boarding pass has a correct flight number and internationally does your identity match your passport. And only then we are permitted to board. See, if ultimately our righteousness is about our position before God, we cannot embark or enter God's presence because we are sinful and our record is completely unrighteous in ourselves. We're stopped and we're denied at the door. But what Jesus has achieved in our place and belief in him means that Jesus gives us his own righteousness so that we are welcomed on board under his name and his record, credited with Jesus' righteousness. This is remarkable. See, the power of the gospel goes beyond forgiving our sins. Just imagine I used most of my mobile phone data, probably streaming kids' TV shows and sport, and so my data usage goes into the negative beyond my monthly allowance of gigs, right? Yet because the telco had some outage, they compensate me giving me extra data. So in crediting my account, suddenly my record went from negative into positive gigs of data. Well, likewise, our sin makes us in debt with God. But what Jesus has done more than has wiped the debt to a zero balance, but in Jesus has gone further to graciously credit our account with his righteousness. God's power and righteousness in the gospel is for anyone too, anyone who believes it says. An open invitation to all, but it's also restricted to those with faith. Verse 17, a righteousness that is by faith. Back to our plane and ship image. Faith is like the connection to the power, the switch in the cockpit that make the electrics work, turning on the powerful engines at the gate or the dock. Likewise, faith in Jesus switches on the power that makes the gospel powerful and real in our lives as we receive Jesus' righteousness. Maybe you remember when that faith was switched on for you, making the power of the gospel real or come to life in you. If not, has there been significant moments on the journey, whether in hard times or in key moments where Jesus has asked for trust, where God has done a new work in you by his spirit? It's the gospel's power. See, look, it's the captain not the passenger who flicks on the switch, turning on the engines. As we continue Romans, we'll see that faith is a gift, a gift from God, not something we conjure up ourselves, but God's righteousness that is credited to us in Jesus. Yet it's also true that we only leave our comfort zones and board that plane or that ship. Why? Well, trusting those powerful engines are going to power our entire journey powering us beyond the startup on the tarmac or dock, but for the sky or sea. Hear these words from verse 17. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So faith activates God's power in the gospel, giving us salvation, new life. And faith also continues to power our lives in Jesus, that continual electrical 
electrical connection powering the engines as we navigate the roughest conditions in life's journey. We don't continue the journey in our strength, but by faith. So faith is a gift, but also as we heard last week, faith is also about obedience, about trusting Jesus each day as our King. And today Paul finishes with these words, the righteous will live by faith. Living in Jesus' righteousness given to us means choosing to step out of our comfort zones at work, at school, in our community to live like Jesus and for him every day, to make Jesus known without shame. In the next I am, I am obligated literally translates to I am a debtor. We've seen in the gospel as debtors were being credited with Jesus' righteousness. I have a mortgage, so in that basic sense, I'm a debtor with my bank. But there's also another way to be a debtor. In a previous workplace, not a church, a colleague came up to me saying, hey, I'm not working tomorrow. Can you pass on this money to Jack and gives me $200 cash? And I agreed feeling uneasy. Have, been, have I been caught up in a drug deal here? <laughs> but my feeling une- unease was because I'd now been put into debt until I passed the cash on to the third party. See, in the gospel, we're debtors to others. If the gospel has spiritually paid all our debts and credited our account with Jesus' righteousness, we're not meant to keep it exclusively to ourselves, but entrusted by God to pass the valuable gospel on to others. So as we encounter friends and family also indebted by sin and shame, we're indebted to them to step out of our comfort zone and share the good news with people who desperately need it. We owe them something valuable. Well, this gospel went beyond this obligation of a debt to pass on. In verse 15, Paul says, I am so eager to preach the gospel. We've seen why Paul was so motivated and internally convicted to preach the gospel to Rome because he encountered the gospel's saving power in Jesus. It was all true. But who is Paul so eager to preach to? In verse 15, it's those in Rome. It's everyone, the Greeks, the non-Greeks. But he's writing to the church, right? Doesn't this church already have the gospel? In verse 8, their faith was being reported all over the world. This church in Rome had an international reputation for their trust in Jesus. See, sometimes we can think that the gospel is just for basics, for the outsiders to hear. But we've seen the powerful gospel starts with faith and continues by faith. Paul's clear here. The gospel is both for Christians and unbelievers. Not just the ABCs of faith, but the A to Z of faith. If you know nothing about the Bible and Jesus and Christianity, you desperately need this gospel. If you're a committed Christian, heard the gospel all your life, you too desperately need the powerful gospel every day. Reflect on some of your responses this weekend. Some thoughts, words, actions that we may not want others to know about. See, when our hearts are so easily deceived by sin, it's actually a problem of unbelief. We constantly need to come back to the good news about Jesus. When our world tempts us to live in our strength, to be self-reliant, we desperately need the power of the gospel in our weakness to step into Jesus' righteousness that's undeservingly given to us. As we finish, in what specific ways are we not living in Jesus' righteousness? How is Jesus calling us to step out of our old familiar comfort zones, the ways we're rejecting the power of the gospel in our lives? If faith isn't leading to obedience, if we're rebelling against God and his word, maybe flirting with sexual sin or justifying greed or anger or drinking, idolizing something, living in the power of the gospel and Jesus' righteousness means turning to Jesus who paid the costly debt to save us from this life 
And this Jesus has credited us to live in his righteous identity today. <clears throat> Maybe you're feeling down or embarrassed about a failure at school or work or in sport or serving here. Maybe you're also catching yourself being arrogant or judgmental. This could expose that our identity has become about our performance. Maybe it's just living in our culture, an online world, just like Rome, all about our strength and intelligence and beauty or success, and you're feeling inferior according to some earthly standard of righteousness. But living in the power of the gospel, Jesus' righteousness, means we can shake off times of failure or success, knowing we are not defined by what we do, but what Jesus has done. Having received Jesus' righteousness, our worth is secure in his approval and acceptance, who says, welcome on board just as we are. Living in the power of the gospel, Jesus' righteousness means at work or school, at the sports club, in those environments where there's pressure to be successful, respected, popular or strong, knowing that we're indebted to share our good news with them, we can risk stepping out of our comfort zone and freely sharing with our friend how we just can't do it and we really need Jesus in our lives. Amen. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek. 